because it is the people CDC by its, like its very nature, certainly it stands in opposition to the cynicism of something like the actual CDC um, and how it operates. But I imagine like what I find as a limitation is that you are basing like when you're doing your weekly reports on, on the YouTube channel, you're basing it off of data that's being accumulated by various states, uh, counties, um, and coming from the CDC itself. Even though they did change their kind of community, their sort of, uh, <clears throat> what, do you, what do you call it, their, their guidance around what is considered safe transmission levels, which is obviously done as a way to sort of normalize COVID infection. Um, nonetheless, their data still put there there you just have to know where to look um so my my question i guess is really like what are the limitations of the people's cdc uh and what do you hope yeah as you move forward like as these limitations continue to to get in the way of us having a clearer vision and understanding of what's happening around us that there can be maybe some developments in certain directions that can maybe make up for that or or i guess i'm just curious what your vision is of the future of this organization yeah, well, we were very happy that we uh, continued this far. I mean, no one had any illusions about whether this would continue. You know, would there be infighting? Would there just be uh, exhaustion? Would there be the 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 notion of giving up as much as uh, a large part of the our, our uh, establishment public health system? Um, so there's no guarantee anything continues. So I mean, I, I go back to like. Uh, you know the Black Panthers or the Young Lords. They were around for a few years. Like that's it. So, like, but having a maximum impact on uh, our Imaginarium and the notions of what could be possible in terms of community response to to health crises. Um, and uh, so, you know, COVID this week uh, depends on on uh, a lot of data. Yes, from uh, CDC and from the states. And um, you know, you do have to know where to look though. And pulling out those data are uh, you know, uh, away from say the CDC version of it, the one they put out on on its face, the uh, uh, community uh, levels map, which basically shows the country entirely green, go outside, no problem. They also have a community transmission map, which says largely red, stay inside. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, in part because uh, the community levels map is based on hospitalizations and community transmissions based on transmission and um, mm -hmm. and uh, COVID testing, but all those data start to or starting to crumble a bit it's kind of like uh looking at a portrait with the wax face start melting but mm -hmm. you can still see the f the face enough so that's our objective like data is crumbling but you, we want to get uh the bigger picture still about where the state of things are so we are something walking on uh, the edge of a knife there in terms of uh what we can show we, we don't oppose CDC. We want CDC to work. The whole point of people's CDC is to try to direct uh, attention toward the, the ways that a fundamental federal agency should be acting, and it's not. We don't oppose the scientists at CDC. Thousands of people there who uh, understand. We've gotten word from people uh, working on the inside that they appreciate what we're doing. They know what we're, at, we're after. We're not here for the destruction of CDC. Um, we oppose the, the, the leadership of CDC and way, the way it's been handled. We oppose the, the White House in terms of how it treats the CDC as its, uh, as its, as its pool boy, uh, basically to wash up, uh, amid, um, political problem rather than actually deal with the, you know, uh, concrete realities of a, of a, uh, BSL three level disease that, uh, can, uh, kill in short order or kill in, in long term. Um, so um, as far as as what's next, you know, we show up every week. We've got work to do. Uh, we've got people who want to do it. Uh, we crank out uh, the stuff that we're doing. Uh, yeah, we have uh, we do get together every once in a while and think big picture about what what we can do and where we're at. Uh, that is part of our strategic planning. Um, it might be that COVID will uh, peter out and we'll be done with this and uh, we can stop what we're doing. It might be this continues on, and uh, even in the face of, uh, you know, the, we might make a decision that, you know what, um, uh, 500 deaths a week is still not uh, uh, reasonable, and uh, we right. might decide to continue to, to work that way. Uh, it's an open-ended um, thing, and, uh, you know, where it goes depends on uh, where the virus goes, where uh, the American people are, where we are. And um, I mean, we continue to get really good uh, feedback uh, from large numbers of people. 
Uh, we just set up a letter to uh, the President Biden in Congress uh, demanding that they reverse their likely decision to end the public health emergency, which would basically throw 15 million people off Medicaid and uh, you know, reduce telehealth for, for older people and all sorts of number of things that uh, would end. And also, basically, it would be kind of the declaration of, of the pandemic is over, even though mm-hmm. people continue to die. But we had a letter that uh, hundreds of, uh, excuse me, tens of thousands of people signed off on. So, you know, there there is a constituency. People uh, who are upset about this. And, um, and it doesn't matter uh, what is said uh, about it. You know, the push uh, that you felt and other people have felt the notion that this is over uh, was, bo- uh, you know, bared upon us by articles that named us in the specific that we are out of our minds, a ragtag team. You know, I think of Emma Green's uh, mm-hmm. article in The New Yorker <laughs> at the end of the of the year, uh, hideous article that actually blew up in her face because it really underscored uh, exactly uh, the thing that you brought out was that, you um, uh, this pressure to to end to pretend that this is over, when in fact people uh, continue to get sick is is uh, a sickness unto itself, uh, and that we had uh, all sorts of volunteers uh, after that article was published, and uh, um, you know uh, again we we take the view that um, you know we where this ends up we're not sure. I think things are not cut in stone. And not just in terms of the politics of it all, but the kind of the epidemiology of it. And it really just speaks to this notion that we are in some sort of endemic phase where you can predict what strains kind of go where and how many people are going to infect it is completely uh, not true at all for uh, uh, SARS-2. You know, I think of, you know, when I think of endemicity, I think of like the seasonal influenza. And I used to work... uh, with Walter Fitch at University of California, Irvine, and, you know, uh, he was one of the fathers of uh, modern uh, phylogeny, and uh, he and his team did some amazing work in the late 90s showing that if you had those strains, influenza strains in one season that had the most evolution at 18 codons were going to likely serve as the progenitor of the strain that comes next year. Now, that's a level of prediction and detail in terms of what what's going to happen next year as far as seasonal influenza i mean it doesn't always work but it, it certainly helps you see the mm-hmm. the flu vaccine uh which i recommend but also doesn't always work and right. uh but that's a level of of a predictability that we are nowhere near uh with sars2 in terms of um how the virus is is likely to evolve uh how it's going to interact with our population uh uh, immunity as far as what com- combination of, uh, you know, vaccination and natural infection that we can kind of stumble together at this point. And, um, you know, um, co- um, and to end this uh, point, you know, like Omicron has a reputation of being less deadly. That might be more because of uh, levels of vaccination and, and natural in- infection. But it is if you let that Omicron rip, it will kill people. It has a thing of basically uh, punching through your nose into your brain. And it doesn't punch like like the previous variants. Mm-hmm. It causes considerable damage in your respiratory tract and leads to all sorts of uh, potentials for dying from it. But it kind of wiggles its way through our nose, but still attacks particular uh, segments of the brain that are, are uh, around... Um, you know, coordination in, in language and, uh, you know, specific parts, uh, you know, uh, engaging in uh, killing particular brain cells and reducing blood flow to particular parts of your brain. Um, I mean, it does other parts, yeah. other things that we can talk about later. But my, my point is, is that we are confusing a particular moment with how it's going to happen. And we've made that mistake time and time again where we entered a kind of valley in the epidemiology of the virus and expected and used that as a declaration that this was over. And we acted surprised again and again that the virus wasn't bending in the direction of our our hopes and wishes and was actually evolving in the direction that uh, most benefited itself. Right. You know, I, I, I speaking as someone that is a total layman, um, 
I dropped out of high school. Just to be fully honest, I dropped out of high school when I was 17. I went to college for a few semesters. I'm not an expert in anything. I'm curious. I like to read. I like to understand things. And I like to talk to people like yourself. And I like to recognize what people's intentions are in the so-called expertise that they have. Now, this is leading to a question I have around scientism that you talk about in your book, because this is an issue with a lot of things where we say, just trust the science, trust the scientists. They have all the information, they know what they're doing, and yes, certainly science is an ever-changing, evolving kind of field, right? We should all expect that science as a discipline, as a practice, is going to learn new things and incorporate that into our worldview and how we understand reality and make decisions. That's all true. And yet there is this aspect of science where it is an institution and it serves certain socioeconomic and political interests. And you encounter this early on in your career, it seems like. I think this is what sort of made you stand apart and has defined your work in contrast to so many other uh, epidemiologists and others working with studying disease and all of these other subjects is like, what are the forces that are actually producing the conditions that are leading to outbreaks of certain viruses and and such, right? So, I mean, this goes all the way back to your first collection with the monthly review, uh, Big Farms Make Big Flu. So anyway, to get to the point of my question, which is scientism, I think people need to have this sort of in their vocabulary and understand what's actually happening here because like we were describing the people CDC in contrast to the CDC, the leaders of the CDC, there is a a gulf there. You're working with the same data, more or less, but the ways in which that data is used is so different. It's almost like we're talking about two completely different realities. So if you could just describe what scientism is and how you explore this concept through your, uh, I guess, your critique and understanding of of how science is used in service to global capitalism, ultimately. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, you know, uh, scientism is the kind of excessive belief in the capacity of science and its techniques to, I mean, to the point that it, it's basically deployed uh, to rationalize um directions that don't necessarily have a scientific uh, bent to them mm-hmm. or if they do have a scientific bent it's not the only thing going on mm-hmm. so you get to go uh and i think of the example of my 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 parents deborah and roger wallace they were in the 70s um they uh were pushed back against the rand institute that was doing some modeling for the new york city and the models basically said we can reduce the number of of fire companies and, and ladder uh, companies in minority neighborhoods because we're going to have we're going to remove them out of those neighborhoods and then if there's a fire we'll be able to use this model to reorient what fire uh, companies are available to cover what's missing and of course that was completely de- disastrous and burnt out many a a, a black and brown neighborhood uh, but if you go at the various um, um, you know, public meetings about this, uh, the very scientists there would basically said, oh, you don't understand this model. This this is not what you're saying is going to happen. So they were in essence hiding behind the equations and, and uh, modeling to basically run cover for what was a political decision to uh, uh, basically uh, undercut the black and brown neighborhoods and the voting blocks that would have uh, in essence voted out the the white power structure. Mm. So that's That's my earliest encounter with this stuff. Um, you know, in this case here, as far as COVID goes, you know, the, there's this, there is a kind of a liberal notion of, of, uh, and, and, uh, leftist notion that science has its place in terms of describing material reality, um, you know, whether to the extent to which, and it, whether to the extent to which it then allows, uh, to act as a kind of basis of values is an open question, right? On the one hand, we like to go, we, we we should wait to make a decision until we have some data in to decide what to do. I think it's a general thought that sometimes you don't have that kind of timing, right? But for the most part, generally, you should have some basis of your action. Uh, now, I'm not talking about people's day-to-day life. I'm talking about governments. I'm talking about decisions about what to do as a society. Um, you know, some of us... Uh, 
you know, our decision to go to a movie, take the day off is because it's fun, right? It has nothing mm -hmm. to do yeah. with what data. I mean, you might have some notions, oh, I got enough cash or or no one's, the, I'm not on the clock or whatever. But right. I, I mean, I'm, th I'm talking about like, you know, uh, science has to deal with collecting data to test hypotheses uh, and make decisions from that. The, the applicability of that is is in play, right? Mm -hmm. The problem then is that it then the, the science science turns into scientism when it just acts as a cover for making decisions that aren't based on any of that or very little. And uh, I mean, Trump tried to do that time and again. Right. I mean, he was uh, leaning on models that said things weren't all that well anymore. I mean, so transparent that everyone was sick into their stomach. I mean, Fauci rolling his eyes out, you, you know, on that on that account is mm -hmm. entirely reasonable. But of course, people CDC, we were. Uh, were outraged when Fauci did the same exact thing in December 2021 when he said that we didn't need 10 days we needed we need to go down to five days mm -hmm. there yeah. is a dis there was like no scientific basis of that they, I mean you know Emma Green in the New Yorker article tried to take the uh <laughs> CDC side and push back on me on that account by saying oh you know it's the most infections in the five, first five days but that's not public health public health is a po populations it's about variation and not just averages and you need to know the extent of that tail because if you send that tail if people were still infectious at uh, 8 9 10 12 14 days you're going to keep the uh, outbreak running continuing mm -hmm. going on the whole mm -hmm. point of 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 quarantine or isolating yourself is that you break the chain of transmission mm -hmm. you do your part and 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 this and it's not about you know you do you it's about you're going to do this to help other people's health and we as society are going to support you we're going to send you some cash to stay uh the f home and not infect anybody else and so that's a difference there between you do you and individualistic uh notions of of health and a public health which is yes each individual has to engage in this but we're going to make sure that you're taken care of we're going to bring you food. We're going to bring you cash. We're going to we're going to put a moratorium on your on your rent. And we're going to make sure that you can do the things necessary to keep other people in, in being infected, and thereby help the economy overall by basically allowing us to all go to work and not get sick and have to stay home even for the five days. Um, so the scientism, and this is what happens when Biden gets in, elected, right? Uh, you know, he ran on the notion of science, I ran on the notion that we're going to follow the scientists. And in the first two uh, essays in my book, the first one, November 2020, the second one, January 2021, I describe the Biden plan. I give it a fair airing. There's a lot of bullshit in it, but I, there's some things that they were going to do. They took the Rooseveltian um, notion of big government has its place at this moment, even though they're a total bunch of neoliberals. So um but they they got off that as soon as possible and instead uh were much better at than trump at using scientific uh uh cover veneer to basically uh have us exit out of the public health program and so every step of the way right you know the cdc declaring in may 2021 that if you're vaccinated you don't need a mask like that, you know, CDC saying this, you know, and this is at a time where all of us knew that Delta, the Delta variant that emerged out of India was coming for us. So you have hundreds of thousands killed in India. We knew and we we made we decided to make the same mistake that Trump did in, in January 2020. It emerged in China. It was going to come here. And we we sat on our hands and pretended this cannot happen to us in the worst of American exceptionalism. And then Biden did it again. It's like, you know, you can't learn from your mistakes or you, you don't want your mistakes to be considered your mistakes. It must be the standard uh, modus of, oper of operation. Like you need this, you need to be able to send people to work however much you, you might hurt them or kill them uh, because you're, you're basically, I think in one of the essays, like, you know, there was a, a terrible joke about, you know, uh, Yale University being a kind of a mutual fund with a campus attached to it and that uh, the U.S. is a stock market with a country attached to it. I yeah, mean, there, yeah. there's some things that are more important than than the very country, even though they all these politicians make these appeals to uh, patriotism and, this, and the U United States and the flag. Uh, they have no problem killing more than a million Americans. Americans and I can't believe that nobody talks about that like you yeah. killed American a million Americans and now you want to 
uh, shit on people who, who who don't want that to happen anymore, and and do so in in the notion of of being uh, that those of us who don't want more Americans to die are anti-American, yeah. uh, and and that gets to your point about how things are so flipped around uh, that the logic of fantasy is is it is becomes comes front and center. Yeah, I think speaking to the the way that time feels warped under a kind of the blanket of a pandemic, it also feels like as this proceeds, I feel like this is the worst time of the pandemic because for those of us that are still doing this, <laughs> I guess you could say uh, gaslighting is high. We are being told we're fucking crazy, <laughs> right. literally. Like, I mean, with with more words than that, but nonetheless, right. that is what it really comes down to. Are you crazy? Stop being crazy. Stop. And I just, I don't know how to talk to a lot of people anymore about it without it eyes glazing over or something it's it's a difficult thing and it's a difficult environment to do the kind of work that you're doing with people cdc Mm -hmm. we're again releasing a second large collection of writings in the midst of a pandemic about the very about the pandemic is eliciting a lot of eye rolls um, unfortunately but you know at a certain point you wonder like i'm speaking to um I'm speaking to people that get it and you're not, it's hard to convert people over to this other side, so to speak, where you're like, we should pick up these mitigation tactics and these protections uh, again, um, unless there's like, I mean, a lot of times when I hear people doing that is because they themselves have been personally afflicted and affected by COVID mm. and they kind of have their assumptions and worldview shaken by that. So I, I imagine that's a challenging aspect of, being in this position as well of, of trying to speak to those that already understand the situation well enough, but those that don't as well. Yeah. Um, anyway, yeah, I just I, wanted I, to comment on yeah, that. Yeah, I, I would say um, uh, on a personal level, uh, you know, me, me to you, uh, Pat, I would say something along the lines of, um, you know, uh, you don't want to get infected with this thing. The more infections you have, the more likely you'll get, get into long COVID and terrible damage. So I, I, I do this to I keep my head down. I want my kids uh, healthy and clear. Mm-hmm. Um, I, you know, so I, I do my uh, impulses are I do have my professional impulses and my professional obligations with people, CDC and otherwise to, to say things. But on a personal level, I go. I am uh, I am not getting this again. Yeah, I am yeah. not going to because uh, uh, the accumulation of damage is so gruesome, and yes. the the notion that any of us have any understanding about what risk we're at is completely off the wall. Yes, those who are immunocompromised are more likely to suffer long COVID, but many a healthy person has gone down in flames. They get it once, they're fine. They get it twice, no big deal. Come third, fourth time, you know they're they're suffering badly. And the and the data are in in terms of the accumulation of it, uh, in terms of under all different vac- vaccination statuses, no vaccination or even vaccinated, um, increasing likelihood of getting a terrible long COVID. And uh, I do and long COVID, that is like that is uh, dropping into a hole that you can't get out of because there's no help for you. Yeah. The medical yeah. system doesn't know what to do with you. They can't even identify that you've had long COVID. And they, uh, as far as the gaslighting go, I mean, that's a level of, oh, of yeah, stuff yeah. going on that you are, it, the gruesome aspect of, of being told, you know, back in the days of um, Lyme disease where nobody knew what that was or even believed that. I mean, this is like times 10 on that or, or orders of a magnitude worse. And uh, so on a personal level, I say, keep your head down. And do the best you can to get through a, a time, a period of time in our country's life that we'll look on back on in astonishment and not in a good way. I yes. mean, you let you let a virus rip through your population. You let kids get it. Like the kids, maybe, yes, there have been lots of kids who have more kids who have died than we like to admit. Mm-hmm. But, uh, you know, what's going to happen in the next uh, 10, 20 years when they start accumulating their own comorbidities? Like, how is COVID going to react to that? Like, COVID, like, here's the things, some of the things I've learned in the past couple of months, like, COVID infections continue on, like, a long, like, up to a year, maybe more uh, than after you first get it. So let's say you have an acute infection, <laughs> you do 25 mm-hmm. days, you're done. Mm-hmm. It's still circulating and replicating in you. 
And so they have, <laughs> they've done autopsies where they looked all through the body parts of people. People who were infected a year ago or now on, the, on a slab for other reasons, uh, detecting um, active replication of COVID-19 in different parts of your body. And these are people like, you know, even after being refrigerated for like 12 days, they pull you out on the 13th day, they're still finding an active replication in you. So you're doing this to kids. They're, they're getting infected, maybe not as bad, but what happens when they get older? What happens when the, the rough and tough of life starts to accumulate as it does to all of us? We will all end up being susceptible or immunocompromised some way, some part of our life, whether early or late. And, um, you know, the, the, you know, what we don't know what we've just did to our kids. We have no clue and we don't care because they're not dying in, in the short term. Um, but that's that's a like a risk that that's a quite a risk that you're taking, you're choosing to do. Mm-hmm. And it's in the scope of things, a couple bad years having to batten down the hatch while we figure out what this thing is probably would have been a good exercise in the pre- pre- precautionary principle yes so you yes. take some precautions and let's you know make sure this. but again there are things more important i mean after 9 11 uh, america's mayor rudolph giuliani said the first thing you need to do is you got to go shop so you know <laughs> it's like uh very clear things there is what's more important than um than your well-being mm-hmm.